Hey Cornerstone, thank you so much for joining us this morning for our third live stream. We are so excited just to invite you into a time of worship and fellowship together, even if we're spread apart. We'll actually be filming from three different locations today, and next week for Easter Sunday, we'll transition to broadcasting at the center. We're really excited just to have you here with us this morning. Um, this is a great time to go ahead and grab a cup of coffee or um, gather up your children around the TV. Um, go ahead and give us a hi in the comments so that we know you're here and answer this question for me. Um, I want to know what is going into your garden this spring. Um, I'm really excited about putting my herb garden together because I really love having fresh herbs um, on my eggs in the morning. Um, and if you don't have a garden or a garden plan, what would you like to have in a garden if you could have one? Um, while you're answering that question, this is also a great time to go ahead and like the video. Make sure you smash that like button, as Nat would put it. And um, go ahead and also share this link on your Facebook page, share our YouTube link. That way we can just invite other people into this time of worship and fellowship together. This is a really great time to consider uh, the online giving option. So you can go to our website or the Church Center app, app to give online. Um, if you haven't already switched over to giving online, this is a great time to try it out and see how it goes. But we're also still accepting the good old snail mail too. So you can put it in the mailbox with a stamp on it as well. Um, this is our last message in the Priceless series before our Easter Sunday, so let's just take a minute to um, prepare our hearts to listen to what God has to say to us this morning um, and just prepare for a time of fellowship and worship. Good morning, church. It's a wonderful day to be uh, back in front of you, and uh, as you can tell, we're at our home here, and uh, we just uh, are happy to be gathered together and to worship His name today. Um, we're going to sing a couple songs today. Again, we're going to sing Glorious Day, um, and then we're going to be singing Broken Vessels. And once again, I just encourage you guys uh, to worship as you are uh, in your homes. Be an example for your family, parents. Um, you have a great opportunity to show what it truly means to honor Christ uh, with every day of our life. And this morning, we want to do that corporately, even though we are separate. And so let's continue this, this morning in worship. We're going to sing Glorious Day. One, two, three, four.
better. And he has provided us this path for salvation. Because we were broken. And we know we need him to make us whole once again. So let's say broken vessels. Cornerstone. It's Pastor Mike, and we're broadcasting for the last time, at least during this season, from our home here. And uh, you know, even though we're doing this through technology, it is 
it's, it's great just to be able to connect in this way. I know so many of you have communicated to me that now that we're kind of getting into the third week, it's been a little tougher. Um, wanting to see faces and all of that kind of thing. And so I understand that. So I just uh, thought before we start today, I would just like to lift up a, a word prayer for us. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we, uh, we humbly bow before you. Lord, your word tells us that we're simply dust that you have used to form into bodies and give souls and to breathe life into us. And um, it's very humbling to think about that. But it's also very humbling to walk through these times and realize who we are and who you are. Father, your word tells us, as we read last week, that when we come to the end of our ropes, it's when we really have a chance to learn how strong you can be for us. And Father, these are just new days, new in so many ways. We feel rattled, we feel turned upside down. But Father, you haven't changed. You have not uh, ceased to be who you are. Father, you are still love, you are still holy, you still make us the apple of your eye. And we know that even when things feel so out of sorts that you're still good and you're still working your purposes. And so, Father, for all of us, um, I just pray that you would again and again give us the peace that surpasses all understanding as we give our cares over to you. And I pray as we come, particularly as uh, just to look at your word right now, that you would take away the distractions you would take away all the extraneous things, the things that press on our minds and our hearts, and help us to focus, and help us to hear you. Father, your word is mighty and powerful, and we, we look forward to what you say in these next moments. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, as we continue on into this coronavirus quarantine, we seems like with every new week, there are new challenges for us, doesn't it? I mean, some of us thought it was going to be short-lived, more of a sprint. And now it turns out that the, that the finish line keeps getting moved out there. And in addition to that, there are hurdles that are being put in place. And now it seems like we're running more of a marathon, doesn't it? Um, some of us are just starting to feel the effects of this quarantine in new ways. Maybe since the last time we visited, your, your jobs uh, might feel a little more questionable. Your summer plans are starting to look even more uncertain than the last time that we talked. Anxiety levels growing, uh, and you're struggling with anxiety. And if you are struggling with anxiety, I would encourage you to check out our perspectives number nine from this past week. It has some real practical ways you can, you can uh, deal with that. But as we continue on, we begin to ask questions like of ourselves like, you know, how long is this going to go on? Can I make it? You know, can I do with uh, the threat of toilet paper going away? Uh, how do I keep my kids on track? Uh, how, how do I maintain my sanity? You know, I was looking at the newspaper the other day, and I know people love to be outdoors just to get, get outside, and now we have the stay-at-home order, but they're still allowing that. But I saw in Roanoke, my hometown, where the Greenway has been so popular for people that they couldn't enforce the distancing, so they, they closed it down. All kinds of changes. In the midst of this, there's this gnawing at our souls that seems to be underlying and behind the scenes in everything that we do. And so with each passing week, we have the opportunity to find out what really matters to us. What really is crucial to life itself? And this really gets at the heart of what this whole perspective series has been all about. You know, the value of true life. And we've looked at some of the values of our salvation through this series. We've looked at the value of being known. We've looked at the value of having a God-sized vision for our life. We've looked at the value of knowing where the true source of life comes from. We've looked at the value of looking into our own hearts and having God lead us there into our vulnerability because we fight it so much. That's what we talked about last week. Now today, as we begin to move into Easter, we want to look at this last um, message in this series, and we want to talk about restoration. Now, speaking of restoration, I have a little something here. 
the thought, take advantage of the fact that we're in our home. But um, this is a 1930s or so uh, Victrola. It uh, came from um, uh, my grandfather. And uh, it was a gift when he passed on to me. Um, it's a classic. It has no, it's not electrical. It's got the turn crank here on the side. It plays old 78s. He's got a, a bunch of my granddad's old 78s down there. Um, none of the artists I've ever heard of. But uh, it's just, it makes me feel uh, close to my grandfather having it here. But you know what? I mean, if you look at the outside, you can tell it needs some restoration. It's got some water um, spots over here. It's pretty nicked up in some places. And it really does need some TLC. But you know what? Even if we fix that, it still could not serve its purpose because it really needs restoration deep inside. It needs restoration in order for it to serve its purpose deep inside. It needs restoration deep inside in order for it to play music, which what it was created for. Now, I don't know about you, but I think many of us are thinking, maybe not the word restoration, but we're having thoughts of restoration, whether we realize it or not. We're thinking about, when can I get back to my normal schedule? When can I get the kids back in school? When will life ever turn to normal where I can go to the grocery store when I want and find what I want? When can I get back to the old patterns of life? And I get it. I mean, um, the start of baseball season has come and gone. I, I, I kind of miss that. But you know what? We serve a God, we follow a God who's into restoration as well. But he's not into the same kind of restoration that you and I are into. I mean, he's not into the, re the surface restoration so much. He wants to restore us deep inside. And I think that as we talk about this this morning, God wants to restore us deep inside of the way the first relationship was before sin ever entered the world. Free of guilt, free of shame, a, a, an ability to come to God with confidence and freedom that we might be ex able to experience the purpose and the music that he made us for. So this morning as we turn to the scripture, we're going to have the opportunity to see how relentless God is in pursuing restoration. Now we know that purely from the fact that he sent Christ. But this morning in the scene that we're going to look at with Jesus and Peter, we get to see how he really wants to work that down into the parts of our lives. And if you've been following this series, you know we've been looking at the facets of salvation through Peter's eyes, and we've been following Peter. And last week, when we last saw Peter, um, you know, he'd been pushing back on the Lord's plan to, you know, go to the cross. And he didn't want the Jesus to go to the cross because he thought that heaven was going to be on earth. And, of course, as we know, um, when he discovered that he was going to lose Christ and thought that he was going to die and that would be it, Peter denied him. He found, he found himself in a moment of real pressure the night while Jesus was on trial, and he denied him, not once, but three times. And then the Scripture says that Jesus looked at him. Peter realized that Jesus was right when he told him it was going to happen and that he knew that it had happened and he was crushed. The scripture says he went out and wept bitterly. He was a broken man. But today, we're going to fast forward several days to the next one of the next scenes with Peter and Jesus and a lot's happened in that time frame. Uh, Jesus was crucified. Jesus was buried. But Jesus resurrected and came back to life. And with that, he created a whole new category for us to look at. This concept of death after life, of resurrection. And, and the disciples had never had that category. All they knew were kings that lived on earth and reigned from earth. But now, Jesus, the man that they were following, was going to be a king in heaven who reigned for eternity. This was big stuff. And Jesus came back after he had risen to spend some time with the disciples so they could let this soak in because he'd been talking about it, but still it just didn't seem real. And the more they spent time with him, they understood 
that Christ was in fact indeed risen. Now, as uh, Peter and Jesus got back together, you might wonder what was going on in Peter's mind. I mean, after the last time he had seen Jesus or Jesus had looked at him, that he kind of blown him off. He denied him. Um, I mean, what's he thinking? I mean, after all, Jesus had told Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. You know, I've got a huge major role for you. Did he even want Peter involved in his ministry anymore? Peter had promised unparalleled loyalty, and he had blown that royally. He denied Christ. Would Jesus ever trust Peter again? All these questions must have been rolling around in Peter's head, but he had learned enough by this time that Jesus already knew because he, he experienced Jesus as the knower of his heart completely. And so he knew that Jesus knew these things. And so what we find here is Peter is in need of restoration, not just from sin, but also from his denial and restoration to his role. And we're going to see in these verses just how Jesus handles this. And as I walk through this, as we walk through this together, I want us to remember that, again, Jesus is the offended one here. And I bring that up because you and I often get in relationships where we get offended. And I don't know about you, but when I get offended, huh, I want to sulk. I want to pull back, and I don't want to engage. But if we look here, Jesus, who's been offended, does not sulk. Let's see what he does. The first thing he does is he took the initiative, initiative and he pursued Peter. If you look in John 21, uh, we're going to go specifically, you can be looking that up on your Bible, on your Bible app, on your phones. But if you look in chapter 21, in this first, in the midsection, about starting with verse 9, it says that Jesus had the disciples there with him, and he sent them out to go fishing and pull some nets of fish. And he pulled just a huge load of fish in. It's interesting, in Luke it actually says 153 fish. I don't know why they... They put that number in there, but that's a lot of fish. They pulled these fish in, they had breakfast, and you got to figure that as they were sitting there around the campfire, all these memories kept flooding back to, to Peter, like how Jesus had once helped him pull a similar catch out after he'd been fishing all night and hadn't caught a thing. Or, or, or maybe the time when he fed the 5,000, all the fish that, that Jesus produced there, or maybe the, the embers burning from the fire reminded Peter of the fire that he stood around as he denied Christ. It was in this setting that Jesus chose to make Peter feel comfortable. You know, we've, we've had a history here, Peter. I want to take care of your, your physical needs before we move on to the spiritual needs. And even though the spiritual needs often trump physical, Jesus didn't ignore that. And as we deal with people, as parents, as you deal with your kids, it's a good lesson for us to, to help folks feel comfortable and, and that their needs are met before we begin to deal with some of the spiritual matters. But at this point, right after they finished breakfast, Jesus has decided to move towards Peter and have a very purposeful conversation. And this is where we want to take the scripture and look at Chapter 21, verse 15, it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. And there are a couple of things that Jesus does here that are very uh, subtle that help this restoration process. It's interesting. He noted here he addresses Peter, not as Peter, but as his old name, Simon, before he met Peter. And there's almost as if he's trying to tell Peter, Peter, you're, you're, you're handling this like you did before you ever knew me. You're trying to handle this in your own strength rather than God's grace. Secondly, he asks Peter a question here. And, and it's interesting, he asks it three times. And say, why is he doing that? Why three times? 
Well, he wants to basically address each of the denials. And he's going to, in a sense, restore each of those denials and, and make it clean, make it good. And, 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 what, and considering what had just happened with Peter, that he had just denied Jesus, the question is really quite remarkable. Jesus doesn't come to him and say, Peter, what were you thinking? You know? Or, or Peter, I, do you not believe in me? Or Peter, how can you expect me to trust you now? Wasn't any of those kinds of questions. Not even close. What Jesus asked is, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? And the reason that this is really the only question that matters is because Christianity is built on love. It's the only religion built on the love of the leader. All of the religions are built on getting to some state or accomplishing some kind of level uh, or, or keeping laws and being obedient. But Christianity is based on the love of Christ and our willingness to return that love. The first time Jesus asked Simon, do you love me more than these? It's kind of a, it's a little bit of a reminder to Peter when, uh, when he, he says these, he's pointing around to the disciples. And it's a reminder of Peter of how he so boastfully uh, responded to Jesus when he said that the disciples would scatter. If we covered this a little bit last week, but Peter said in Matthew 26, 33, he says this to Jesus, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And there's just more of a hint in those statements that Peter really did think that he loved Jesus more than the disciples. And what Jesus wants Peter to see here is it's not a competition. It's not a matter of whether you love me more than Thomas or John or Bartholomew or anybody. It's the fact, do you love me, Peter? He wants Peter to see this situation through the eyes of his grace. This is about you and me, Peter, no one else. Peter's response is really interesting. There's no trash talk this time. There's none of this, I'm better than the brothers here. Now he's very humble, and he has learned through the events of recent days that Jesus knows him very, very well. And so he appeals to that. He says, Lord, you, you know, you know that I love you. Here is the expression of a man that's been humbled. He hasn't been defeated, but he's been humbled, and he realizes that he's, although humble, he's confident in his attachment to Jesus it's interesting, too, in, in these three times that Peter says, I love you, he doesn't use, actually Jesus asks, do you agape love me, Peter? Which means a godly kind of love. And Peter says, no, I, 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 I do, but I phileo love you. Which basically is saying, this is all I can manage for right now, Jesus. And I'm going to be honest with you, because you, you know my heart. And, and that's where he is. You know, it's, it's really good. To hear that, actually, because so oftentimes when people fall, and you and I, we fall in obedience um, to Jesus, and we think, oh, there's no love of Christ in me, or I would have never done that. And then the enemy begins to drag us down this road. We get so consumed with how little love we have for Christ, and before we know it, we're, we can't even find Jesus because we're so focused on ourselves. If that's where you find yourself, and you've fallen, and you, you question your love, Maybe it's not where it was, but, but friend, if the Holy Spirit's in you, there's a love there. And I would, I would encourage you not to look at yourself and your lack, but look at Christ and His willingness to want to engage you and restore you. There's another thing here that um, we should point out, and it happens as a result of Christ asking this question. It clears the air. There are all these like eggshells that I'm sure Peter was trying to wander around and, and Jesus didn't want that. He wanted to clear the air that, Peter, you love me. I know that, and I, I'm, I'm meeting you where you are. And it's so important that Peter's able to say this because of what's about to come. Because one, if we don't love Christ, it, we're not fit for service in his kingdom. I mean, a lot of 
folks I know and even myself sometimes fall into wanting to serve Christ out of the wrong reasons. Not for love, but for my ego, for meeting my needs, for getting attention, or all these things. But if we're really truly going to serve the Lord, it needs to be out of a love for Him. So following Peter's answer, Jesus does something that in a way shows Jesus' restoration is not just words. He really does trust him because he gives Peter an entrustment. He says to him, feed my sheep. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, the Bible and um, have this, these kinds of terms, Jesus is not talking about farm animals here. He's, this is a, a, a picture of the flock, the people of, of God. And Jesus is calling Peter to take care of them. And in this first answer, or the first charge he gives to um, Peter, he, he basically is saying, I want you to be a shepherd, which is an awesome responsibility that, P, that Jesus has entrusted to Peter to, to be the shepherd to his people. Jesus is saying to Peter, I want you to take care of my followers. And he, he does this, it's interesting. He does this in a way with these three feed my sheeps. He does it almost as a building crescendo because the first time he says, Peter, I want you to feed my lambs. These are obviously the the little lambs, the the newborns. And and just like in uh, in the real life and and the farm animals, you need to give more attention to those newborns. Same thing in God's flock. You need to give more attention to baby Christians. They need, they need milk. They need to be nurtured. They need to be protected. But Jesus didn't stop there because in the second feed my sheep, he uses a different word for feeding. He actually uses the word ten, which is an expanded responsibility. It's not just feeding. It's guiding. It's protecting. In the, in the, in the congregation, the flock of God, we're told that wolves will come at them from time to time. And... Uh, and the shepherd needs to be willing to lay down his life to protect the flock. And that's what Jesus is, is calling him to, a bigger role. He's not just in charge of the newbies, but he's in charge of the whole flock. And then finally, when he says, feed my sheep for the last time, in the Greek it reads, feed my dear sheep. In other words, these are not just young and old, all combined sheep. They are dear to me. So it almost builds like, Peter, I'm entrusting you with this. You are restored. And he was restored. He went on to be a great champion of the faith for Christ um, and just a, a founder of the church. You know, this Victrola, <clears throat> it means a lot to me because it makes me feel close to my grandfather. But you know what? It's not alive. And what I mean by that, it doesn't play music. I mean, I could have it restored, but to be quite honest with you, it's not worth it for me to pay the money for it to actually play music and to be restored. But fortunately, uh, God doesn't look at it that way for us. He has spared no expense, my friends. For you to be restored in Him. He's, he's, he sent His Son, His most precious, precious possession, to die for us that we might be restored. You know, with that in mind, just a couple of questions for us. Could it be in these days of the pandemic that we are tempted to focus on restoration of the surface stuff, the scratches, or the little things in our schedules that have become, you know, kind of inconvenient that they're gone now. Could it be that God wants us to get past those issues of the surface so that we might be able to do business with Him and be restored in the deeper parts of our lives? Could it be in these days, as we have no place to run to as we normally do, we we don't have as many voices uh, maybe talking into our heads, that we have an opportunity by God's design to get away with Him and let Him speak to us just like He pulled Peter away and spoke to him. That we might receive some of His restoration work, not on the surface, but in here. 
We see from the scripture this morning that God is a God of restoration. Amen, right? And he pursues us in order to make that happen. What if God is pursuing you? Do you know what he's saying to you? What if he wanted you to use this time to restore your heart, to reorder your priorities, to mend your marriage, to build on your relationship with your kids, to reprioritize your life? That it would enable us to walk with Him without regret, without fear, without shame, without guilt. That our lives would not be about our kingdoms, but we might, what we might be able to do in His kingdom on into eternity. <clears throat> you know, my guess and hope is, is that there are not going to be times like this in the rest of our lives. I hope not. I really hope not. But how will we use this period of time. We use it complaining, worrying, binging, sleeping, just burning time, or intentionally spending time with the knower and the lover of our souls, the one who knows what you were made for, the one who knows what kind of music your life can make. I'm going to ask you in your homes and where you are now just to take a moment and talk amongst yourselves. And if you have a sense of what God is saying to you right now, would you take a risk and just be willing to share that? And again, if you're uh, not with anybody this moment, maybe just grab a notepad or your journal and write down and capture some of those thoughts. I'll give you just a couple of minutes and then we'll come back and close. I'm going to close this with a word of prayer uh, before Sarah comes back and gives us the last few minutes of uh, communication. Um, really glad that you chose to spend this time with us this morning. Um, if you haven't had a chance to already, check out our online app or if you go to our website, you can give there. Uh, it really helps us during these days. I know it's tough for all of us, but it really does help the ministry continue to go forward. So let, let me pray for us. Father, we are so grateful that you are on your throne, that you see just where we are. We don't have to tell you about it. We don't have to inform you about it. You know us just like you knew Peter. And Father, you know the parts of us that need restoration. And Father, at this time in, in our lives, this very, very unique time has been set aside that we as individuals might come before you and let you restore, begin to restore relationships, begin to restore hurts, wounds, begin to get our attention and to redirect our priorities. I pray, Father, that in these days we would slow down and hear your still, small voice. It seems to me that these days it's speaking louder than ever. So, Father, just help us to hear and to heed it. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. We look forward to spending Easter with you next Sunday. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning for worship. It has been such a delight to be able to connect with you, even if we're all in our own homes together. Uh, we'd just like to extend that invitation to connect even more now as we open up our Zoom pop-up meeting. We hope you'll uh, get online right after this. Tell us hello. We'd love to hear from you and just to see how you're doing. So um, hope to hear from you soon and hope you're doing well.